<laughs> the Dalai Lama, his great wish, he wishes for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell anybody the wish that or it won't come true. <laughs> Just about enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do we cut it up? And So Bonte, before we started, um, it, w it was asked of me if I would, in honor of your birthday, um, sing a metta chant or a portion of the metta chant in honor of your teachings. And so, um, and I, I, I understand that monastics are not meant to get pleasure from music and entertainments. So I will do my best to be as bad as possible. Uh, to, uh, to be as bad as possible. <laughs> no, you can try to be as good as possible. So um, if people want to follow along the words, I tried to leave copies on the tables. So I dedicate this to Bhante. Sabe purisa, sabe. 
Sabe Aria, Sabe Aria, Sabe Dewa, Sabe Manusa, Sabe Vini Patika, Avera Hondu, Avya Paja Hondu, Aniga Hondu, Sukiatana. Lada Sampatito Mawiga Chantu Kama Saka. Very good. Testing. T testing one, two, three. Okay. Okay, thank you, everybody. Very kind and thoughtful. Okay, so let us begin with the homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhutasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhutasa Namo tasa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambhutasa. Okay, good morning, everybody. Okay, so today we will be continuing with Sutta number 62 and the Machamanikaya. Again, this is the Maha, Maha Rahulo Vada Sutta the creator of the longer discourse of advice to Ramava. Okay, just to review that the, the main part of this discourse, Venerable Rahula goes to the Buddha and asks how mindfulness of breathing is of great fruit and great benefit. But the Buddha doesn't directly or immediately explain to Rahula how to practice mindfulness of breathing. Instead, he begins by explaining to him the meditation on the five elements. And probably the reason why the Buddha is explaining the meditation on the elements to Rahula is because, as I mentioned last week, Rahula is now becoming a young man, he's 18 years old, and he's developed pride, some degree of pride, based on his, apparently, his physical beauty. And so the Buddha wants him to be able to overcome the attachment to the body. And so the way to overcome the attachment to the body is by examining the body in terms of the five elements, and seeing that all of the elements are anatta, not self, not to be taken as I or mine. And the five elements are the four primary material elements, earth, water, 
fire and air, and then the space element. So last week, we went through the meditation on the four elements. And this is an interesting point to note that, you know, usually when we explain Buddhist meditation, we think that you start by practicing samatha, or concentration meditation, and then you move to vipassana, insight meditation. But in this sutta, the Buddha begins directly by teaching Rahula the elements, the meditation on the four elements, and that's an insight meditation subject. And then as the sutta unfolds, the Buddha will introduce meditation subjects that belong to the usually classified under samatha, serenity, or stilling the mind. And so, even though the usual procedure is to develop samadhi or samatha before developing vipassana, another approach is possible by which insight comes first, and then based on the insight, one, one goes on to balance the insight, by developing serenity or concentration. Okay, so what we covered last time takes us through on page 529 through section 12. Now we come to section 13. And it seems here the Buddha is going to use the four, or actually the five elements as similes, but the emphasis here is going to be on developing equanimity, or this, the commentary explains this with the technical term. Yeah, the technical term is tadi bhava. Which can mean be translated as equipoise or imperturbability. Okay, so this quality that's to be developed is tadi bhava, equanimity, balance of mind, imperturbability. And so the Buddha will use each of the five elements as a simile for showing how, for showing that particular quality that is to be developed in meditation. So he says, Rahula, develop meditation that is like the earth. For when you develop meditation that is like the earth, then the arisen agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. They won't obsess your mind. Okay, so this is the kind of ideal quality to be aimed at through the practice of meditation. But eventually the practice is moving in the direction of equanimity. And as one is moving in that direction, then certain barriers come up. And here those barriers are put into the two categories, the two things that tend to move one away from
Somebody was asking you a question on the other. Actually, I couldn't type in the words, so I need to open another page. Oh, okay. I didn't aware that the sound is on. Okay. Okay, so as one is moving towards equanimity, the two sort of distractions, the two things that tend to pull one away are sometimes painful experiences, sometimes pleasurable experiences. The pleasurable experiences are described here as agreeable contacts, and the painful or disagreeable, well, the painful or unpleasurable experiences are described as disagreeable contacts. So the agreeable contacts could actually be of two kinds. One is, you may call the pull of the lower mind. That is the mind which is pulling you towards kind of like thoughts of, sensu <coughs> of sensuality, thoughts of sensual indulgence. This would be like the hindrance of sensual desire or the fetter of sensual craving. And then the higher type of agreeable contact would be the blissful, rapturous, or very agreeable experiences that arise as the mind becomes collected and concentrated. So even though those <clears throat> higher pleasurable experiences are signs of progress, signs of you know, auspicious signs, but if one becomes attached to them, then they will hinder one's progress. And so one has to overcome the agreeable sensations or agreeable contacts, whether the, they arise from sensual thoughts, sensual ima images and um, imaginings, or whether they be the more blissful, rapturous, delightful experiences that come through the collection of the mind. And then there come <coughs> the disagreeable contacts, which can be sometimes physical. You know, when one is sitting in meditation, there'll come pain in the legs, pain in the joints, pain in the back, in the back. And also there'll be disagreeable mental experiences. Again, sometimes lower types of experiences. For example, thoughts of anger, thoughts of ill will, recollections of sorrowful, things that make one feel sorrowful, angry, frustrated, or thoughts about people that one doesn't like. So these will all be experiences arising from the hindrance of ill will. But then there's also a higher type of disagreeable contact or disagreeable experience that comes when one strives very diligently, very earnestly, and one has high expectations, and then one doesn't fulfill one's expectations. Often one thinks one can just move very rapidly into the deeper stages of meditation, and instead you have to plod through rough stream after stream of distracting thoughts, and then this one can cause one to become, to feel frustrated, to feel upset, to feel disappointed. So also these are types of disagreeable contacts. And so we could say that generally the disagreeable contacts, usually they would fall in the category of the hindrance of sensual desire or the hindrance of ill will or aversion. And so for the meditation to deepen and to become consolidated, one has to remove these, agree disagreeable, these agreeable and disagreeable contacts. And when removes them, of course they arise naturally, 
But one removes them by not giving them special attention, but letting them go and moving, keeping the mind focused on the meditation subject. Though if certain of these types of experience become particularly persistent, then there are approaches to meditation which can be used as their precise antidotes. The text will come to these in a later section. Okay, now the Buddha uses a very well, it's a vivid simile to illustrate how one develops a mind that is like the earth. So he says, just as people throw clean things and dirty things on the earth, but the examples he gives are, gives are only the dirty things, excrement, urine, spittle, pus, and blood, but also people will throw maybe flowers, <laughs> maybe burnt out sticks of incense, leftover food, which is delicious, but if it's too much, it might be thrown away on the earth. Okay, so the earth will not be repelled, humiliated, and disgusted because of the dirty things, and also it won't be attached to the pleasant things that are thrown on it. But the earth is open and accepts everything, whether it's clean or dirty, beautiful or repulsive. And so the Buddha says, develop meditation like the earth, so that the agreeable and disagreeable contacts won't obsess your mind. Okay, then he uses the simile of water. And then he says, to illustrate, to use water as the illustration, he says, just as people wash clean things and dirty things in water. And so, you know, we go to the toilet, the excrement, the urine goes into the water. If we have to spit out, well, actually in Asia they use the spittoon, so people spit into the spittoon, and then they wash the spittoon with water. Or if one gets a wound and then pus and blood flows out, then one washes it with water. But the water isn't repelled, humiliated, and disgusted by those repulsive things. And also when we use water, water to wash things that are considered beautiful, beautiful clothes, if you have beautiful hair, <laughs> beautiful face, and you wash it with water, the water isn't attracted and excited, but the water treats everything the same. So in that way, develop meditation that is like water. Then develop meditation that is like fire. And again, the simile, just as people burn clean things and dirty things. For some reason, they always use the, the dirty things in the in the extension of the simile, excrement, urine, spittle, pus, and blood, but also they would burn. What are some of the clean things one burns in fire? Incense, yeah. Birthday candles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, candles, that's the candles, incense. Um, in Asia, we have the coconut oil to make the coconut oil lamps. In Tibet, they use butter lamps. So the fire doesn't repel by the this by the dirty things, and it doesn't cling to the beautiful, or valuable things. Then air develop meditation that is like air. And just as the air blows on clean things and dirty things, it blows over, let's take some beautiful things, clean things, it blows over fields, of flowers, grass, wheat, rice. 
and also it flows over the dirty things like excrement, urine, spittle, pus, and blood. But the air is not, doesn't become delighted when it flows through the flowers or the woods, picking up the scent of the pine trees. And it's not repelled when it has to blow over garbage dumps and cesspits but it always just remains the same, it just moves the same. Okay, then develop meditation that is like space. Okay, just as space is not established anywhere, so develop meditation that is like space. For when you develop meditation that is like space, arisen, Grable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. So space is all pervading, and therefore space can accommodate everything, whether it's considered beautiful or ugly. Space can hold, again, the fields, the flowers, the trees, the woods, great works of art. And space can also hold ugly cities, or polluted cities, um, garbage dumps, cesspits, all of them are located in space. Okay, so the four or five elements are say, all embracing, all accommodating, they can accept everything good, and bad, beautiful and ugly, without any attachment to one and diversion to the other. So metaphorically, we can say the five elements are always in a state of equanimity, balance, equipoise. They're not disturbed by anything positive or negative. Okay, so now the Buddha is going to teach Ravala several meditation subjects that help to establish the state of equanimity, the state of equipoise. So first come the set which make up the four Brahma-viharas, the four divine abodes, the four sublime states, And these four are to be developed towards other sentient beings, other living beings. And their main purpose, you know, just looking at them collectively, is to overcome the disagreeable, to overcome things like ill will. And so we have first developed meditation on loving kindness. This, you know, this is metta. Neil recited so beautifully just before the chant of loving kindness. So the quality of metta is wishing for the well-being and happiness of all beings. So metta takes all beings in general as its object and its special characteristic is to wish for the well-being and happiness of all beings, oneself as well as others. So wishing beings to be well, that is to be healthy, to be healthy of body, health, peaceful of mind, and wishing them to be happy to experience happiness, joy, peace, contentment with their lives. And when loving-kindness is developed, then it will eliminate its opposite, the negative quality, and that is biapada, ill-will. So loving-kindness is the special medicine the antidote 
towards anger, resentment, or ill will. Okay, the second Brahma Vihara is compassion, loving kindness of compassion. And compassion in Pali, karuna, this is the quality that makes the heart shake or tremble with the suffering of others. And it becomes manifest as the wish to help people or beings who are afflicted with suffering, the wish to relieve the suffering of others. So compassion has its special object are people or sentient beings who are afflicted with suffering. Whereas metta begins in a universal way, a general way, with all beings. But the special focus of compassion are those who are afflicted with suffering. And its objective is to relieve the suffering of beings. And then here, I'm not so happy with the translation, it says that through developing a meditation on compassion, any cruelty will be abandoned. I'm not sure that cruelty is such a good rendering for the hesa. The hesa is more like harming others or creating trouble for others. seems to suggest maybe taking a special pleasure, a kind of malicious pleasure in harming others. Whereas vihesa or vihinsa seems to mean simply harming others or inflicting suffering on others. It doesn't necessarily suggest that malicious pleasure that the word cruelty does. In any case, as one develops compassion, then one can feel and experience the suffering of others as if it were one's own. And so one can sort of inwardly relate to beings who are experiencing suffering. Then one doesn't want to inflict any suffering on anyone. And so the meditation on compassion is the specific method for knocking away this tendency towards harming others, so causing trouble and distress for others. Okay, the third Brahma Vihara, here it's translated altruistic joy. This is in Pali, it's Mudita. Let me write all of them. Okay, the word mudita, literally it means simply joy, 
But since this is coming in the context of the four sublime states, it's normally understood to mean rejoicing with others, that is, rejoicing in the happiness, success, good fortune, and good qualities of others. And so when one thinks about other people who have achieved fulfillment of their aims, who have achieved some success, whether it be worldly success or even spiritual success, or one thinks of the good qualities, the virtuous qualities of others, then one shares their own joy in their success and their good qualities, and one rejoices in that. So another word we can use for mudita is anumodana, which means more explicitly rejoicing with. It's a kind of congratulatory attitude. And then it's said that when you develop the meditation on mudita, altruistic joy, then any discontent will be abandoned. Discontent here is, I think it's arati. So this meditation on altruistic joy is actually very valuable when one feels that one's, say, one's meditation practice is dry, or one feels lonely, or somewhat discontent with one's practice. I mean, everybody goes through periods like that. But sort of one way to overcome that is to suffuse the mind with joy, with happiness. And one could do this by thinking of the good qualities, the virtues of others, and rejoicing in their good qualities. And to do this, one doesn't even have to choose, or doesn't have to, the way I, I see it, one doesn't have to start with specific people that one knows, if one finds it difficult, what you could do is like think of the Buddhas and rejoice in their attainment of Buddhahood. <laughs> and then think of all of those who have reached like advanced stages of the path, maybe the great bodhisattvas, the arhats, the great noble disciples, and rejoice in their attainments. And then rejoice and all of the people that you know who are doing good in the world. And then this will help to build up joy and happiness in the mind. And to really sort of advance in the spiritual life, it's extremely important to have joy and happiness. This is joy and happiness. This is actually the foundation for focusing and concentrating the mind. So when one arouses this altruistic joy, then it leads to the arising of piti, of rapture, or delight, and then that will lead to sukha, to happiness or bliss. Okay, and then the fourth Brahma Vihara, fourth divine abode, is called Upeka, equanimity. And since the Brahma Viharas are concerned with living beings, this is equanimity towards other beings, other sentient beings, other people, other sentient beings. And the way I understand it, it doesn't mean indifference or apathy towards others but it means impartiality. 
It means being able to look on other beings as equal, without having special preferences for this one over that one, but thinking of all beings as essentially the same. No complaints from you. <laughs> And also, sometimes one has to also develop equanimity when, especially when people are undergoing suffering that one really can't do anything about. At a certain point, in order to protect one's own mind, one has to accept that there are conditions where one can't really be effective. And so, under those conditions, one develops the meditation on equanimity. And one could do this. There are two approaches that I've learned. One is through the teaching of anatta, and that is reflecting that all beings are really without any kind of true, permanent, substantial self, just, you know, processes of the five aggregates. And then this one enables one to sort of step back and look at them without this discrimination or bias. And then the second approach is to reflect on karma, that beings inherit the results of their karma, that all beings are the heirs to their karma. And so again, it doesn't mean that one doesn't try one's best to help people who are subject to different types of suffering, but when all one's efforts don't bring, don't come to fulfillment, then at a certain point one has to be able to look at the situation with equanimity. And one can do this by reflecting that beings inherit the results of their karma. Okay, then, here in this sutta, the meditation on equanimity is given as the specific antidote to aversion. It's said that when you develop meditation on equanimity, then any aversion will be abandoned. Aversion here in Pali is patika. This strikes me a little bit puzzling, because aversion is usually connected with ill will. So one would think that the antidote to aversion will be loving kindness. And I found, wait, I found in another sutta in Anguttara Nikaya, where the Buddha is speaking about how different meditation subjects are opposed to certain defilements or unwholesome states. He says that the meditation on equanimity is the antidote to attachment. So it seems to me that maybe equanimity can be the antidote to both attachment and aversion, because its purpose is to establish the balanced state between, well, not between, not between attachment and aversion, but the balanced state that transcends attachment and aversion. Somebody is going to comment? Well, I, I just was, as a social worker, I'm working with people who are... Yeah, maybe if there's that um, mobile microphone. Okay, anyway, you have a... Anyway, I, I just wanted to say that when you work with people who are severely burned or have severe mental illness, yeah. your instinct is initially aversion. Oh, Okay, that's... so oh. the equanimity is the, the thing you have to learn when in the midst of population suffering, 
Yeah, oh, that's a very good point. Oh, yeah. that's, that's a very good observation. Yeah, I'll just uh, repeat that so that people in the back could hear. She said that she had been a social worker and sometimes she has to work with people who were in the, had extreme burns, were in extremely debilitating conditions. And then the initial reaction is one of aversion, and then to overcome that and to be able to deal with them, one has to develop equanimity. The choice of virtue should find the quietest abandonment, quiet will be abandoned for one development of equanimity. And pride, pride. Yeah, It's, in the Chinese version, yes. it says that equanimity will overcome is to overcome pride. Yes. I'm not so sure because later we'll see that the perception of impermanence is recommended as the way to overcome conceit, the conceit I I mean it might be in the Chinese version, but it seems not so satisfactory to me as either attachment or aversion. Any questions or any comments at this point? I think a long time ago we talked about karma. You said that some things yeah. were not as yeah. things have happened. Yeah. Had yeah. nothing to do with yeah. it. Yeah. Maybe because I said that one of the ways to develop equanimity is by reflecting that beings inherit the results of their karma. Right. Right. Yeah. I, in fact, I see that to be something like a skillful, let's say a skillful means rather than to take it as a doctrinal statement that whatever happens to people happens as a result of their karma. Of course, this is in the under the circumstances where one tries to do one's best to help somebody, but no matter what one does, nothing can be done to help them. So then, under those conditions, one can reflect that well, people inherit the results of their karma, maybe this is that person's karma to suffer, and then one just has to accept the situation with equanimity. I guess we never know. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, so I wouldn't take, you know, the reflection on karma to be establishing a doctrinal point, whatever they're undergoing is definitely the result of their karma. But if one reflects on the working of the law of karma, then at least it gives one a way to accept the situation as being incorrigible, unchangeable. Because maybe it is due to a strong karma that's working through that person. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was surprised to hear you say that in the context of the Brahma Maharas that the Pekka refers specifically to beings, yeah. and I guess sentient beings. Yeah. And also, I was curious about the distinction between Pekka and Padibhava, which are also calling equanimity. So I wonder, and especially since you're saying these Brahma Maharas are Practices to develop. Yeah, yeah. That. So one of them is equanimity, and it's a practice to develop equanimity. Yeah. So I'm wondering if maybe Tati Baba is a more encompassing kind of equanimity that involves more than just human beings. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, these are two good points. Yeah, first, the word Upeka, equanimity, has, it occurs in several contexts within the early Buddhist texts. So in some contexts, I mean, one of the main contexts is the Brahma Viharas. And there, I think, to interpret it, we have to see that the other Brahma Viharas are concerned with living beings. And so equanimity here should be understood to deal with beings. And that's the way it's explained in the commentaries as well. But there are other contexts where Upeka isn't referring to impartiality towards other living beings. Like sometimes what's 
the texts speak about six-factored equanimity. That means equanimity through the six sense faculties in regard to agreeable and disagreeable sense contacts. And then there's equanimity as an enlightenment factor, you know, one of the, the, the last of the seven factors of enlightenment. And there, equanimity is a state that develops, you know, through very deep meditation. And I think there, it's particularly through insight meditation. After one has gone through samadhi, then one comes to insight, and then through the deep insight meditation, then the mind remains equ equanimous amidst the arising and passing of conditioned phenomena. Oh, yeah, the Tadi Baba, it seems, has the broader meaning of, I'd say, equipoise in regard to, here the text gives it in regard to agreeable and disagreeable contact, contacts. I've seen some texts which explain it as remaining balanced in regard to what's called the eight worldly phenomena. Gain and loss, honor and dishonor, praise and blame, pleasure and pain. So the balance in regard to the eight world, worldly phenomena, the, the four pairs of worldly phenomena, that is Tati Baba. Yes, please. Yeah. But when you talk about mindfulness, <laughs> you are establishing mindfulness. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Could you comment on that? Actually, that's a good point. <laughs> But I don't think, you know, comparing, the, developing the meditation on space isn't intended to imply that one doesn't have the mind fixed on a particular meditation object, but rather the idea, I think, here is that <clears throat> one doesn't allow the mind to become fixated on either agreeable or disagreeable sensations. But space is able to, because it's not established anywhere, so it's able to accommodate everything. So you don't cling to anything. Exactly, exactly. In fact, what's stated here seems to be what comes in the Satipatthana Sutta when, also in the standard phrase, vinaya lokaya bicha dominasang, having removed a bicha craving and dominasa, displeasure or grief, in regard to the world, that seems to be like the, basically the same point as not um, not letting the mind become obsessed with agreeable and disagreeable contacts. And then in the Satipatthana Sutta, at the end of expo each exposition, it says, "Nacha kinchi loke upadhyati." He doesn't cling to anything in the world. So I say that that not clinging to anything is that attitude of not being established anywhere. But of course, for the meditation to develop, then one has to establish the mind on the meditation object. Any other question, comment? <coughs> Okay, so let's go on then. Okay, now these 
the way I would see it, these <coughs> four meditation subjects, the four Brahmaviharas, are primarily directed towards overcoming the disagreeable contacts. Of course, it's disagreeable contacts which tend to arouse aversion. And the antidote in general to aversion are the four Brahmaviharas. Here I'm using aversion in a broad way, which can encompass ill will, cruelty or harmfulness, discontent. And so when one develops the four divine abodes, the four Brahma-viharas, then that negative attitude towards others turns into a positive, welcoming, embracing attitude. And so one overcomes the disagreeable sensations. But then there is the agreeable, which is the bait of clinging, the bait of attachment. And so to overcome the attachment to the agreeable, the next two meditation subjects are brought in. So in paragraph 22, we have the meditation on, here it's translated as foulness. The Pali word is asubha. So a supa means literally not beautiful, not lovely. And this is the meditation which is developed specifically in relation to the body in order to overcome sensual desire, which is rooted in the perception of the body as being beautiful and lovely. <laughs> And so this meditation is practiced always based, initially based on one's own body, seeing the body in terms of the constituent parts, usually 31, 32 parts are mentioned, very similar to the four elements, or at least the first two elements, except in this case one is not focusing upon the bodily part as representing a particular element, but rather focusing upon the unbeautiful aspect of the bodily part. So we have, I think it's 20 parts representing the 20 solid parts of the body, hairs of the head, hairs of the body, the nails, the teeth, the skin, and then moving on from the skin to the flesh, nerves, bone, bones, bone marrow, then the inner organs, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, those are the tissues that hold the intestines in place, the stomach, the feces, the brain, then coming into the liquid parts of the body, bile, pus, blood, bile, pus, blood, sweat, fat, then tears, synovial fluid, that's the oil of the joints, oil of the skin, spit, snot, urine. And so one goes through all of these parts of the body 
not in order to develop a disgust or repugnance towards the body, but to see into the real nature of the body. And as one sees into the nature of the body, then one develops this perception of the unattractive nature of the body. And this is for the purpose of, as the text says, for the purpose of abandoning raga, sensual lust. And so sensual lust, sensual craving, flourishes based upon the perception of the body as being lovely and beautiful. And so the purpose of this, and then the reason why one perceives the body as beautiful or attractive, it's because one just grasps the superficial appearance of the body, and one perceives the body as a whole in terms of a general impression. But when, when one actually dissects the body mentally into its constituent parts, and then focuses on all of these parts individually, then one sees that the body is not really very attractive. And so perceiving the body in that way will help to overcome sensual lust. Okay, and then the other defilement which represents a kind of clinging or grasping to what's pleasant or agreeable is called conceit. In this case, it's the conceit I am, asmi mana. And this is the, it's not simply the conceit of thinking, I'm the greatest, I'm the most wonderful, but it's the idea or conception, I am, that arises based upon the five aggregates. So from this first or primary conceit, I am, there evolve all the other more elaborate types of conceit. I am better, I am the best, I am better than they are. Or else I am just as good as they are. Or else even the kind of self-devaluing, self-depreciating, self-deprecating conceit, I am worse than the others. So all of those are based on grasping the five aggregates as being a truly existing I, I am. And so to overcome that conceit I am, one focuses upon the five aggregates in terms of their impermanence, so on investigates the five aggregates, bodily form is impermanent, arising and passing. The mental side, the feelings, arising and passing. Perceptions arising and passing. Volitional formations arising and passing. Consciousness arising and passing. And so one gets the clear perception of the five aggregates, as being all impermanent, and then whatever is impermanent cannot be taken as being as being truly I, truly a self. And so in this way, by examining the impermanence of the five aggregates, one moves from the perception of impermanence to the perception of non-self, and the perception of non-self removes the conceit I am. Okay, so these two meditations on foulness or the unattractive nature of the body and on the impermanence of the five aggregates, those two together help to overcome the attachment to what's agreeable and attractive, either to sensual pleasures or to the idea of I, to to conceit I am. Okay, maybe at this point then I'll ask whether any questions or comments.
Okay, one question. Will equanimity become discompassionate or uncompassionate? Um, what I say is that there's a danger, a risk, that if one puts too much emphasis on one Brahma-vihara at the expense of the others, it will lead to a kind of imbalance. So if somebody emphasizes equanimity too much without also paying attention to loving-kindness and compassion, then they might lose the comp compassion. So ideally, the four Brahma-viharas should be cultivated with some degree of balance between them. And what's usually recommended, almost prescribed, is before one develops the meditation on equanimity, one cultivates the other three Brahma-viharas first. So in this way, the, when equanimity develops, it's not destitute of loving-kindness and compassion, but it's, we could say, it's suffused with them, enriched by them, so that the four Brahma-viharas hold one another in a very delicate balance. In fact, there's a very beautiful essay written by my own teacher in Sri Lanka, the German monk, Vedavanyana Punika. It's easily available on the internet. It's called The Four Sublime States. His name is Jnana Punika. And if you just search it out on Google, Jnana Punika, the four sublime states, you'll find it. I think it's on Access, the website Access to Insight. And he begins, it's a short essay, it's just about 30 pages, 25, 30 pages. But the first sections, he deals with each of the Brahma Viharas individually. But then he has a section in which he shows the interrelationships before, between the four Brahma-viharas. And it's really, I think, it's one of the most magnificent pieces of Buddhist writing that's ever, um, ever been written. It really shows extremely subtle, delicate insight into the relationship of these four qualities. So I don't think I could ever explain the interrelationship of the Brahma-viharas more beautifully than Venerable Jnana Punika has done. Okay, any further questions? Yep, yeah, Neil? Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm sitting here wondering, um, you know, it says develop meditation on balance, develop meditation on perception of impermanence, and that's really all it says. Um, and I know that Yeah. Those sort of more specific practices of how to develop the yeah. yeah. Most of them seem to come other than, I guess, the foundations of mindfulness, which is right here. Most of these other kinds of meditations come later, like the Buddhaghosa, perhaps. Like, or, like what? Like the metta that I recited, is that from uh, the, 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 the Sumimaga? Uh, it comes later. You no, know, that seems to be, a, I think that originates in Burma. The actual chant, I think, is probably a Burmese composition. So, I guess I'm just wondering if in a lot of these cases, um, that's all the Buddha really... Do you think that's all the Buddha really... Yeah, this is a very... Uh, that's an interesting question, and it's something that I've thought about quite often. I'll just repeat the question for the internet. The question is that we find in this sutta, elsewhere, very often, just the topics of meditation are just alluded to very briefly, but we just don't find any kind of detailed explanation of how to practice them. And I've thought about this, and I don't know, I don't have a definite answer, but my sup supposition is either the Buddha himself gave more detailed instructions, but 
you know, because the text had to be preserved through oral transmission, and so if you have detailed instructions, and people are charged with memorizing all of the details, it would be, become too much of a burden, too much material to transmit. And so, what I would, one hypothesis is that even though the Buddha himself gave the instructions orally in more detail, but they were not included within the canonical texts, but they were just passed down in the lineage of teachers. The other hypothesis is that the Buddha himself didn't give detailed instructions, but he knew that his disciples, who would, uh, were accomplished in these meditation practices, could develop and give more detailed instructions. And perhaps the Buddha didn't give detailed instructions because he knew that there are many different ways of practicing these meditation subjects. So if he gives one specific set of instructions, then everybody says, ah, that's coming from the Buddha, that's it. You know, that's the one authoritative method. But if he leaves it open, then maybe a lineage coming through Sariputta will explain in one way, a lineage coming from Mahakasapa will explain in another way, a lineage coming through Mahakachana will explain in another way. So there are many different ways to, you know, to develop the meditation subject in detail. And so the Buddha didn't want to tie it, the instructions down to one specific system of development. I mean, even we have like Anapanasati, where there's fa fairly detailed instructions, but you know, if you look at contemporary teachers explaining Anapanasati, <laughs> you know, everybody has their own method. You know, maybe the Thai teacher, Achan Li Damodaro, has his method, then Achan Buddhadasa has his method, Pa Aung Soyado has his method, and they're all, Thich Nhat Hanh has his method, and they're all interpreting the 16 steps of Anapanasati <laughs> laid down in the Sutta. So, there's always room, I think, for variation based on individual experience. Okay, let me put it. Yeah, um, I'm just curious uh, how do we, how can we relate the sutta to to the four foundations? To the four foundations. Yeah, the sutta itself doesn't explicitly use the four foundations of mindfulness as its theme, but some of the meditation subjects here can be seen as falling within the <coughs> excuse me <coughs> within the scope of the four foundations of mindfulness. Like the first part on um, at least the four elements, the meditation on the four great elements, comes within the elements section of the Satipatthana Sutta. In fact, this illustrates the point, just coming back to Neil's question. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha treats the four elements very concisely. He says, how does one practice the four elements, um, it says here the monk reviews the same body by way of the elements thus. In this body there are the earth element, water element, fire element, and air element, and that's it. But then this sutta elaborates on the four elements. You know, how does one practice it? By analyzing each element, seeing each element is represented by certain parts or processes in the body. Okay, so that section belongs in the Satipatthana Sutta under the elements meditation. Then we have here the meditation on foulness is given very concisely very briefly, but in the Satipatthana Sutta it's given in greater detail in terms of the 30, it mentions the 31 parts. 
And then we have here in this sutta the mindfulness of breathing, which is mentioned in the Satipatthana Sutta, but only in terms of four steps. But here, the mindfulness of breathing is elaborated into 16 steps, or 16 aspects. So these come actually within Usaidu. You can either put all 16 steps from this sutta into the Satipatthana section of the into the mindfulness of breathing section of the Satipatthana Sutta. But there are some other suttas which distribute the 16 steps of mindfulness of breathing into the four Satipatthanas. So they, each tetrad, a group of four, gets assigned to one of the four Satipatthanas. Okay, I think we'll have to stop for the morning session and then we'll come back and we'll finish the sutta next week. So that's the 17th. So if you get an Na'ah to tell Sister Sutama, she's always sending out the announcement, sutta number 64, number 64. <laughs> then I have to tell her, no, we're still at 62. <laughs> so if you get an announcement next week, 60. For just remember in 62. Okay, so we'll end with the sharing of the merits, and then at lunchtime, the sharing of the birthday cake. Thank you very much, all, everybody, for offering that cake. And then we'll come back after lunch, say 10 after 12, for question and answer section. Okay, so we'll share the merits with the Devas, the Dhamma protecting deities, the Buddhas, the, the Nagas, the dragon spirits, the Buddhas, the fear spirits, requesting them to protect the Buddha's teaching, to protect the world, to protect ourselves and others. Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Nahitika Punyanta Nanumo Dipa Chiram Rakantu Sasana Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Nahitika Punyanta Nanumo Dipa Chiram Rakantu Desana Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Nahitika Punyanta Nanamodipa Chiran Rakanto Mantra Eta Patacham Hei Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabhe Deva Nomodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Eta Patacham Hei Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabhe Buddha Nomodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Eta Vatacham Hei Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Satanu Modantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Tavadupadaya Vichyeta To Etantare Satakayupapana Rupi Arupicha Sasanya Sanino Tu Kapamuchantu Kosanto Nibu Ting. Okay, then we'll, we'll end with three short bows to the Buddha. Mm -hmm.